This video is a result of an experiment I conducted with my flatmate Michael, who studies animal behaviour. We had intended, we have been interested in many things, but had finally concluded to establish whether there was a relationship between an animal's happiness and the amount of time it took to kill and to remove any trace of an ostrich. <laughs> We set the requirements for the experiment, establishing a clear method so that anyone who wanted to repeat the experiment could do and would be able to with ease and agility. It was perhaps this desire for the replicability of the study being smooth, graceful, yet efficient, and thus powerful that led us on to the choice of the male lion as our subject of study. A perimeter was erected. It was a 10 by 17 square meter uh, Zoo Tycoon 4 base, or terrain is divided into squares. Um, chain link fence, which would enable the lion to remain inside, physically separated from the humans who had come to see it. The lion could then wander around his exhibit, enjoying or perhaps not enjoying the various variables which constituted the interior of said exhibit, and in reacting in certain ways, he could give us a taste of the world from which he had come from, or been designed for. For example, a lion's change in happiness, indicated by the red and green smilings which rise up from the lion's head to burst above it, might suggest that the environment it is in is either good for it or bad for it. This goes beyond preference. We have to consider what kind of a purpose a lion has. And seeing as though a lion is not involved with or afflicted by the world of humans as of yet, we have to conclude that the lion's primary purpose is to pass on its genes and that everything which constitutes a lion's behaviour, if it hasn't malfunctioned, is or has been at some point in its, e in its evolution of history a vehicle for achieving its purpose. This is interesting, as a lion in a zoo is now in a place where its behaviours are not necessarily needed. For example, the zookeeper will come into the exhibit and give the lion meat to eat. A lion therefore does not need to hunt, and therefore its choice of fur colour does not need to be in alignment with the colour of the floor anymore. We can change the terrain from savanna grass to brown stone, and the lion, if attuned properly to its current situation, will neither become more nor less happy. The fact that it does, however, means that the lion is now involved in a performance of mind. It is responding to a context which does not exist. Uh, the lion was watched. The watch is waiting until the lion has stopped moving. Once it was still, the game was paused and the watchers recorded the lion's level of happiness. The ostrich was then released at precisely four squares away from the ostrich, from the lion, and the lion was timed to see exactly how long it would take for him to catch up with the ostrich, maul it to death within a dust cloud, and leave no trace of its carcass anywhere upon the map. <laughs> the recordings were then noted down within a table and the data processed into a graph, which upon inspection revealed in fact that there was no correlation between the lion's level of happiness and the time it took to kill an ostrich. The two variables, happiness and killing time, were unrelated, and if any relationship was to be established between the two, then it would have to be down to chance. This conclusion might be representative of a real lion's reality. However, it also might be indicative of a problem with the extraction. The creators of the game, Zoo Tycoon, would have collected data through observation and research of a lion's reality in the wild, and then used this extracted data to recreate the reality within the game. This could be compared to the data extractions that are used within actual zoos, and artist talks where the artist collects knowledge about their audience's desires, so they might best facilitate, facilitate their audience's needs. These knowledge-based extractions form the foundations of the consequently designed content, whether it be an exhibit for a particular animal, the movement patterns of a lion in a computer game, or the structure and content of a delivery of information. The foundations, however, would always belong to the past, and thus a gap would always exist between information and reality. Something would have changed. The foundations can always contain more detail than it does, meaning that somewhere along the line, what is being created is not based on extractive knowledge, but is rooted in something else entirely. There is also the possibility of extracted information being misheard translated incorrectly and vague, and furthermore, an inability to meet the extracted expectations can always exist as well. In all, it would be quite impossible for gaps not to exist between designs and desires. The unnecessary, the inappropriate, the opportunity for photo bombing will always exist, simply because no one has a clue on what is going on at all. 
However, if we do have a purpose, then it might be within our interest to keep an eye out on the extra bits that slip in and make sure that they don't derail, derail our train. To tailor our suits so that they are tasteful as well as functional. It might be wise for the zookeeper designing an animal's exhibit to see what is occurring within these gaps and make a decision as to whether to keep it or not. If the answer is no, then a barrier must be erected and the unwanted content kicked out. If you are a revolutionary, however, it might be wise to fill the gaps with so much expanding foam that it takes over the structure you're replaced with. If one is a pacifist, then try not to exclude anything but instead aim for a balance. And if you don't have any real intentions at all, but rather are using design and function as things which can be slipped in and out of, then do all of the above, pick a handful, or do nothing at all. In conclusion, we're always going to have to deal with barriers. To do what we want might require erecting them, breaking them down, jumping over them. Either way, we have to negotiate the things which are preventing us from doing or getting to where we want. A lion responds to what he doesn't want by tracking down, mauling, and removing any trace whatsoever of the undesired, regardless of its current, current level of sadness. The protagonist of the book put me in the zoo by Robert Lobshire, um, a yellow dog who can change the colour of his spots, hang from a tree with his tail, and take its spots from its body, grow them, shrink them, make them into one, apply them to the surface and even juggle them, responds to being thrown out of a zoo by joining a circus, a place which is more accommodating of the protagonist's potential. <laughs> the artist Matthew Butler <coughs> explores the possibilities within self-imposed barriers or restraints, and Genghis Khan, to get past China's defense system, the Great Wall of China, simply rode around it. Um, I was actually going to do an exercise, if you want. Um, I bought some crash mats, and I thought I, we could like erect a barrier, and then we could sort of practice different ways of negotiating it. Yeah. That's so, that's fun. Think of this as like practice. It doesn't have to be perfect. <laughs> you tried. The effort was there. Yeah. But take a part of the camera. You smash through it. <laughs> <laughs> Liz, that was shit. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. Yeah? Yeah? The more capabilities you have for sort of negotiating barriers, the easier it will be to. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
for what he can do. <laughs> <laughs> They will make a crumb dip. Ah, it's in the cupboard. It's all good. <laughs> Thank you. 